now we get to geek out on the Internet of Things, Ray, and um, um, hopefully we'll have time to get to artificial intelligence and, and attending events through VR and stuff like that, too. Ooh. I mean, this is cool. So these are our friends at uh, the R Street Institute. Their website is rstreet.org. Free markets, real solutions. How's this for a job title? Technolo- Technology Policy Fellow. Sounds like a fun job. Wouldn't you like yeah, to be a me. fellow someday? Uh, yes. Right. Can, please. Welcome Fellowship to the sh- of the Ring. <laughs> right. Welcome to the show, Ann Hobson. How are you? Great. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Um, I love what you've been writing. It's, I love geeking out on this stuff and, and, and thinking about the future. And in a lot of ways, the future is now. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, what got you interested in technology, specifically like technology policy and artificial intelligence? Watching the show Humans, maybe? Partially. So Westworld is a great example of something that is uh, sci-fi futuristic yeah. uh, that can get people excited about this. Uh, but I actually, for a time, was able to work at Facebook in their policy office in D.C. And they dealt with all issues as a multinational corporation that is a tech uh, industry corporation does. So I got to dive into a lot of this. Uh, VR, they own the company Oculus, for yeah, example. Yeah. Um, and so they, they were uh, excited to have policy hands on deck to look into some of those issues. And so your job at R Street, uh, the think tank, R Street Initiative, as a technology policy fellow, I mean, it's really your job not just to follow and track this stuff, but to really influence how uh, laws get written, right? Yeah, we do a lot of that, and we do a lot of defining new emerging technologies for lawmakers and helping them to understand what exactly they're dealing with. Okay, well, that's good. And you've got some articles in The Hill. Uh, We talked with your cohort on your article in Slate about uh, driverless cars and how that could lead to a shortage of organ donations, which is bizarre. It's one of the most fun interviews we've had. Um, But lately you've been discussing uh, the government regulation of and cybersecurity of the Internet of Things, and I've read a couple of these articles, and, I mean, at the beginning, you're like, well, there's like three different definitions for the Internet of Things, so we kind of need to figure that out first. Yeah. Uh, So I actually go through a good two pages of definitions from different sources, Uh, but what I decide is that the Internet of Things is really an array of connected devices, and those are devices such as Amazon Alexa or even smartphones uh, that can send and receive data. Yeah, and so, and, and any more appliances or, I mean, would you consider even the smart light bulbs part of the Internet of Things? Yeah, smart light bulbs, or if you're on the East Coast, if you ever use an Easy Pass, those have RFID chips uh-huh. in them that communicate. Yeah. So all of that stuff, um, you know, and, you know, now you can get a refrigerator that tells you when you're out of eggs. Um, yeah, yeah. And there's a camera attached to it where you can see inside the refrigerator they've solved the problem on whether or not the light goes out in the fridge when you close the door. We finally have the answer. Exactly. So you put your finger right on the issue here. Really what the Internet of Things is doing is improving our lives in these little teeny tiny areas. Like, for example, being able to turn off the lights if you're lying in bed. Yeah, exactly. Oh, story time, Ray. All right, I'm ready. Okay, so when I was, oh gosh, I was 10 probably, and I took um, I took fishing wire, and I put took some nails, and I and I ran the fishing wire one down along the floor, one along the ceiling, to my light switch, and I put a rubber band to hold it in place, and I could turn my lights off and on from bed. What kid doesn't do I this? Was, every kid does that, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See? Yeah. Exactly. So now you have an app. That's boring. No, I'm kidding. Um, it's exciting times, but there's uh, Ray. Get the sound effect ready if you are the dun 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 because this is this could be serious. All of the internet things. There's potential for hacks. And yes, it's dramatic. So, it can be dramatic. I know. I- I really wish I had that uh, signal playing in the back of uh, my work office <laughs> right. when I wanted it. Yes. Yeah. But basically, um, there's a huge problem here with the scope and scale of the amount of devices that are out there. Um, they can actually be uh, attacked in a way in which you can turn a bunch of devices into a botnet, which is really just a zombie army of devices. And then you can have them all attack one website or one server. 
And this has caused a lot of problems, most famously in October of last year, uh, there was a huge uh, cyber attack of this nature. They're called Distributed Denial of Service Attacks, or DDoS, if you run into that on the Internet. Right. Um, it basically means that you or I couldn't access some of these sites for five hours. Yeah, and the way that works most commonly that I'm aware of is, you know, sometime earlier in the year, I'm, I was on my computer and I got an email from a friend, hey, Mike, look at this, ha-ha. And I clicked on the link, and maybe there was a video, maybe not, but it installed something on my computer. And then the the bad guys, wherever they are, now can control my computer when they want to um, repeatedly try to go to this one website that they're trying to deny service of, and you amplify that out by a few million computers, and you've, and you've got something going. If you got your refrigerator involved, it can be even more dramatic, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so you point out that human error is actually – one of the biggest causes of a lot of cyber attacks. Right. So whether, whether it be social engineering or phishing, clicking on a link or putting a really bad password in like one, two, three, four or password. That's a classic. I better change uh, then it. And you really, yeah, exactly. Then you, you better, uh, you better go and, and, and fix those things. Right. Um, okay. So here are some other things and, and you sort of allude to it. I want to get a little more hit John Podesta. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> Ray types comments on the computer screen for me sometimes. That was good. Um, so here's some specific examples on some things that you kind of alluded to. So, like, for example, there could be blackmail. So, you know, I'm thinking of putting a drop cam in my windowsill uh, and use it as a webcam for my website, TucsonWeather.us, and that would be great. But it also includes audio. Um now, I'm, I'm not saying drop cams doing anything wrong, but, you know, maybe someone could somehow ha- hack into that feed and then they could listen to everything that's happening uh, in that room. That's where my parakeets are. So that's really all they'll hear. But if, you know, if something nefarious, if I was committing crimes or something and and they got a hold of that audio, uh, they could blackmail me, for example, um, would be one thing. And then the other point to that is you point out that. As people try to regulate this, as government tries to regulate this stuff, they're not very good at it because they're always three steps behind. Let companies like Dropcam make sure that their security is solid so that I don't get blackmailed. Exactly. And there are actually some really cool aftermarket solutions that are being developed that are outside of government. So one of these is a Cujo or Dojo. It's a device that you can attach to your router and it'll sort of monitor the traffic to other Internet of Things devices in your house. And then it'll tell you if there are weird patterns happening. So you can know if you're participating in a botnet, for example, which is pretty cool. I would like to know if I'm participating in a botnet for sure. Um, how about my smartwatch? Can My smartwatch is connected to my iPhone through Bluetooth, and I have a Samsung smartwatch on an Apple iPhone, which is weird. But um, if I'm at... You know, if I'm at Starbucks and I'm on their public Wi-Fi, could someone get into my watch somehow and get the accurate time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So really just getting into one Internet of Things device inside a network, right. uh, you can potentially get into the other one. So it's, your toaster can help hack your TV. Right. It can help hack your computer. It can help hack your cloud. And next thing you know, you're a famous actress with with nude pictures on the Internet, which has happened recently. Yeah, and you brought up uh, John Podesta. So this was in the Hillary Clinton uh, hacking scandal. Basically, what he had done is put a typo in an email. He said, you know, you shouldn't click on this when actually, or you should click on this when actually you should. And then uh, John Podesta clicked on it. And that led to a lot of documents being released to the public, which <laughs> furthered that scandal. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's funny, actually. It's funny, but it's sad, but it's dangerous, but it's interesting. Um, it's time for our break, so we're going to do that. And then when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Anne, Anne Hobson. She's a technology policy fellow with R Street Initiative, rstreet.org, to find all the fun stuff that they do. When we come back, artificial intelligence. Will you go to your next concert with VR technology? Well, probably not your next concert, but maybe. Stay right there. Cross-town traffic, awesome. 
That's funny because we're just going to get ready. At, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about smart things, and one of those things would be like the smart traffic stuff. So um, Ray's telling me about the wall during the break. I have not heard. It's like the newlywed bit game and Plinko combined. That's right. Wow. Wow. Ann Hobson is our guest. She's a technology policy fellow with the R Street Initiative, rstreet.org, to find all this fun stuff. I want to talk about the Internet of Things just for another minute or two before we move on to AI, which is a whole other show. So we'll have you back because we've got this whole thing going on with R Street now, and I'm just pumped about it. I love you guys. Um, sure. But I was telling Ray during the break, like some of the other things, you know, like um, if you're using – uh, some sort of smart technology to predict traffic patterns or to detect traffic patterns and to um, better, you know, have a flow of traffic through. And you're using either a program for that or some sort of AI for that. Um, you might be, if you could hack into that, it might lead you to maybe the electric grid. And kind of the point is with all of these Internet of Things out there that are, if they're interconnected on your network and you're the government, you're only as strong as your weakest link. Yeah, exactly. So we're already talking about artificial intelligence, and one of the things that really concerns uh, legislators about emerging technologies is what happens when those decision-making processes are applied to physical things around you. So could it be that uh, a malfunction happens in your driverless car and then that ends up having uh, human injuries, for example. There are some real-world consequences when it comes to uh, things being uh, the ones that are doing things and making decisions. Yeah. I mean, movies have been written, right? Terminate when, you know, when Skynet becomes aware, we're toast. I'm, I'm just ready for that. I mean, if you can hear my voice, you are the rebellion. Yeah, and one of the things that I like to pay attention to is some of these shows and how they portray these emerging technologies. So Black Mirror is a really good one. That's oh, and, we were just talking yeah. about that. I told Ray, I asked Ray if he saw the episode um, where basically they're playing this out in the episode uh, and he hadn't seen it yet. So we'll just do a spoiler alert, but go ahead. Yeah. So one of the episodes is uh, a bunch of bees yep. are replacing actual real bees. And so these bees are all robots, and the idea was that they were placed there because the old bees are dying off, and so you needed something to pollinate the flowers. But then these bees, which are run by uh, artificial intelligence, uh, some software operating somewhere telling them what to do, um, start to have a mind of their own, and they start to actually rebel against humans and, and do things that to harm humans. And it's actually a frightening episode. I remember <laughs> yeah. not being able to sleep after it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's worse than that. Someone takes – anyway, I don't want to give the whole thing away. Just, uh, I mean, a word of caution for the kids. It's not This is not a kid's show, Black Mirror. It's definitely rated R, but it's a great show. Uh, and, and episode three, they really hit it out of the park, that episode in, in particular. I mean, but, uh, they, you know, they, there's the other one when earlier when I was talking about blackmail um, where, you know, someone takes over someone's uh, audio device or – or camera on their computer, and then they end up blackmailing all these people and making them do what they want them to do. <laughs> so, th th you know, there's that part of things, too. Yeah, the current equivalent of that right now is ransomware, which is a type mm -hmm. of malware that's growing in number right now. But what it does is it will get into your system, and then it will decrypt your, or encrypt your files, and then it will charge you ransom in something like Bitcoin or some electronic uh, money, and then you have to pay that so they decrypt your files. And they don't always decrypt them. So it's, it's, it's a gamble. <laughs> right, it is a gamble. But don't call the police or the data gets it. <laughs> Something yeah, like that. Yeah, but we're talking about some of the scary parts of all this, and yeah. I think it's important to sort of point out that these shows are meant to do that, and right. they're taking one aspect of technology and they're taking it to the extreme. The but what we have right now yeah. is very different. Yeah, what we have right now is mostly benign and everything is fine, um, you know, but we need to stay on top of it. So let, let's make that transition into um, people using artificial intelligence or bots to buy tickets to events early and basically buying out all the tickets so that they can scalp them. And a lot of uh, states are, are starting to put an end to this. Uh, but you say they may not need to in the future because uh, the future of going to events is going to make a lot more tickets available. 
Yeah, so it's really about a supply and demand problem. A lot of people want more seats than there actually are for events like Hamilton or Beyonce concert. So in those cases, it might be that they can actually virtually experience those events. So you could have, you put on a VR headset, virtual reality headset, and you could be sitting in your living room with a beer, and you can be actually sitting in one of the seats uh, during that event live. And so you could have 20,000 people sitting in the same single seat in a stadium watching that from VR. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. So they would put a 3D camera from the perspective of one of the seats and, and and feed the audio and everything, and you'd be able to experience it on your living room with a beer that will be a lot less expensive than you would get at the event. Precisely. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you read Brave New World. I read it like 100 years ago when I was a kid. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the thing, too, where they had the en- enhanced theater experience for the upper caste uh, but if you were genetically engineered not to be a lower caste, you didn't get to experience that. We're not talking about that necessarily. But um, these kinds of experiences that are coming are going to get better and better because right now VR is good. But, yeah. you know, you right now you take the full resolution of your phone and you have to split it in half, one for each eye. And so, you know, if your phone is 1080p, you're going to get half of that. You know, you're going to get something like 720p. And so you're going to see a little pixelization. It's not going to be as sharp as you're used to. Uh, my son da- has an Oculus, and he loves it, and he games with it a lot. But he, you know, he says the same thing. He goes, yeah, you don't get the full resolution because, you know, you're dividing it in half for each eye. But all of these things are going to be solved. And so this, you know, going to see Hamilton, which I'll, I may never get to travel to go see, um, you know, if I could buy a ticket for 10 bucks and watch it from home on really good VR, that's going to change the entertainment is- industry. Yeah, what I really love about VR is that it's something that you experience. Mm-hmm. So you watch TV and you listen to the radio, but experiencing is a whole new thing. And one of the cool aspects that makes it so much more worth buying and doing is haptic gloves or some sort of haptics, which is a touch-based system. Mm -hmm. So, like, you put on a suit or you put on a pair of gloves, and then you can feel yourself grabbing things in virtual reality or or touching the world in virtual reality. And that makes a huge difference mentally. Yeah, and and that's the part I was thinking about with the Brave New World tie-in because the way, you know, that book starts in the theater with the experience that the upper cast is having – is, you know, something out of this world, and it's, you know, mostly technology-driven. Yeah, yeah, holodecks are coming, right? Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting about what you bring up is is the adoption aspect. So uh-huh. it's like, who's actually going to have access to this technology? Right. And a lot of books make the assumption that it's only going to be the upper classes. But I really think that if you look at smartphones, if you look at some of those technologies, like in the future, we could all be using VR, and it, the price point could be pretty okay. So uh, this will be our last talk because we're pretty much out of time. But I wanted to get your thoughts on this. It was recently in the news. I think it was Bill Gates suggested that robots who take human jobs should pay taxes. And I'm assuming that would be the employers. Um, But it still could be a good deal for the employers because, you know, you can work them 24-7. They don't take sick days. They don't take vacation. Um, And I'm thinking, yes, this is the answer to where the robots are doing those mundane tasks, and the rest of humanity can have the latest iPhone and take it easy and be creative or whatever. Yeah, so one book that really explores this concept is uh, Kurt Vonnegut's Player Piano, which is a pretty good one. And it looks at a society in which you do have people that uh, that are living off of sort of a government universal basic income, and you do have people that are the people that are working with the robots, and they make a lot more money. Um, But one thing I always like to point out there is there's always a role for humans. Like, there's creativity, there's an innate, tacit humanness that robots can't actually uh, do yet. And that's going to be the distinguishing factor for a long time. And I think you're going to see adoption very slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, this stuff is all fascinating. And the, the main reason why it is fascinating is it really is coming um, I was joking around with someone the other day. It's like, you know, in the not too distant future, there will be restaurants that as a selling point will say they have human waiters. <laughs> so like if, if you want a human waiter, come to our restaurant instead of all the other restaurants that have robots. 
That's exactly right. I think people do want to interact at a human level when it comes to a lot of different jobs. Right. I mean, it's fascinating to watch technology and where it is and where it's going. And and the policy aspects are fascinating, too. And that's your job, Anne. So uh, yeah. thank, thank you for your expertise. And uh, like I said, we love R Street. Just encourage people to go to rstreet.org and see all the all the fun things that you guys have your have your mitts into. Thanks, guys, for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Ann. We'll do it again. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's a Friday Eve. The weekend is almost here. Now, normally there would be a U of A basketball game tonight, but uh, we have the night off. The next game is Saturday against the community college or something? Some kind something. of weird college. I don't know. We don't care about it. Well, we'll talk about it next in our U of A sports update with Dana Cooper. Say right there.